Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. My beloved brothers and sisters, as we gather together to celebrate these most sacred mysteries, we pause calling to mind our sins. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. pray. O God, strength of those who hope in you, graciously hear our pleas, and since without you mortal frailty can do nothing, grant us always the help of your grace, that in following your commands we may please you by our resolve and our deeds. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I too will take from the crest of the cedar, from its topmost branches tear off a tender shoot, and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It shall put forth branches and bear fruit, and become a majestic cedar. Birds of every kind shall dwell beneath it, every winged thing in the shade of its boughs. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, bring low the high tree, lift high the low tree, wither up the green tree, and make the withered tree bloom. As I, the Lord, have spoken, so will I do. The word of the Lord. Lord, 
It is good to give thanks to you. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name most high, to proclaim your kindness at dawn and your faithfulness throughout the night. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. The just one shall flourish like the palm tree. Like a cedar of Lebanon shall he grow. They that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. They shall bear fruit even in old age. Vigorous and sturdy shall they be, declaring how just is the Lord, my rock in whom there is no wrong. Lord, it is good to give thanks to you. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, we are always courageous, although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet we are courageous, and we would rather leave the body and go home to the Lord. Therefore, we aspire to please him, whether we are at home or away. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense according to what he did in the body, whether good or evil. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. The seed is the word of God. Christ is the sower, all who come to him will live The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark.
Jesus said to the crowds, This is how it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day, and through it all the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Of its own accord the land yields fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wields the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, To what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Of what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, that when it is sown in the ground, it is the smallest of the seeds on the earth. But once it is, once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it. Without parables, he did not speak to them, but to his own disciples, he explained everything in private. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So for almost three weeks now, as a church, we have been back in ordinary time. And this is the first of the weekends in which we've been able to celebrate that. As we know, two weekends ago, we celebrated the Solemnity of the Holy Trinity, and last weekend we celebrated the Solemnity of Corpus Christi. So as we begin our, perhaps, I guess, resume this ordinary time, this long period of God's grace in ordinary time, we see today that the focus is on the kingdom of God. And one might be able to argue, as we're just in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, that perhaps one of Christ's favorite topic, if not the favorite topic, is simply this, the kingdom of God. His first public sermon began with, the kingdom of God is at hand. And from then on, he kept talking about it, as we hear today, even in the Gospel. So, if there is a kingdom, there must also be a king. And if there is a king, there must also be subjects. That's how Christ sees his church. He sees it as a kingdom, not merely some type of club or group or anything like that. Today, we should ask ourselves, how do we see the church? We pray, thy kingdom come. Do we mean the same thing Jesus meant when he taught us that prayer? God's kingdom is a realm where hearts obey him out of faith and love. Not out of fear, but rather out of faith and love. And yet, the kingdom of this world is a realm where hearts obey themselves out of self-centeredness, egotism, and fear. If we really want to help Christ redeem the kingdom of this world by transforming it through his grace into the kingdom of Christ, we then have to keep hearkening to the king and carrying out his commandments even when they are uncomfortable or when they grade against our selfish tendencies. Let's be honest. Obeying someone, though, it is is, though we are called to do so, can be most challenging because we are sinners. And Jesus knows this. So he doesn't ask us to follow him blindly or with mindless obedience. Rather, he uses the parables to explain and to promise that in following and obeying him, our lives will be fruitful, very fruitful. The virtues that give true, lasting beauty to our lives, that give our lives meaning and deep happiness, virtues such as wisdom, courage, self-control, faith, hope, Christian charity, are the seeds in the Lord's parable. And when these seeds are planted in our hearts as they were when we were baptized, and as we follow and obey Christ in our daily lives, they grow and flourish. And when we come to receive the Eucharist, they are nourished with the bread of life. Being good citizens of Christ's kingdom is the sure path to an abundant spiritual harvest, both here on earth and most importantly, forever in heaven. So once we leave behind that inadequate idea that the church is a religious club or a group and begin to see it as God's kingdom, and Christ is the real king with a real mission of redeeming the world and rolling back evil, I believe it makes a big difference 
It gives us purpose and direction to all that we do. As most of you know, I love talking about saints from um, the pulpit. And this week, I came across a new saint by the name of Saint Polyuctus. And Polyuctus, I believe, gave a great example of this. Pretty certain no one in here has ever heard of this saint. But what he was, was he was a rich pagan officer in the Roman legionnaire back in the third century, so in the 200s. And during that time, during the 200s, great persecutions were taking place, right? So great saints in which we celebrate, St. Lawrence, St. Lucy, St. Sixtus, St. Tarsisius, all of them were during this period of time. And this particular man, as I said, the rich Roman pagan officer, was living a glorious, glamorous, and a self-indulgent li life in Armenia. And as he lived there, which is in the far outposts of the Roman Empire during this period of time, the emperor issued a new decree against Christians. Unlike today when decrees or when things are sent by presidents or kings, they're immediate, it took months at times for it to reach parts of the empire, almost even years, depending on where you lived. So when news of this new decree came out, one of this legion or one of the soldier's friends, a Christian friend, felt a sudden urgency that he had to help his friend convert. With, he doubled up on his efforts and convinced this future saint of Christ's love Christ's truth, that Christ was the king, and that the grace of God would give him full victory, victory in his heart, victory in eternal life. The saint Polyuctus converted, and it was such a complete conversion and transformation that the former Roman official, when he finally received the decree, the paper, he ripped it in half and, 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 and said not to persecute Christians. And not only did he do that, he went even further. He broke up a pagan religious procession by smashing their idols that were being carried. The other soldiers didn't take very well to this, and he was immediately arrested, imprisoned, and tortured greatly to try to make him return to the office of his pagan religion. But his courage would not budge, so his torturers changed the tactics. They decided instead of torture, they would argue with him instead. In fact, they even brought his wife and his children before them into the courtroom, hoping that their suffering would convince this former legionary to return to the emperor's fold. It didn't. Through it all, St. Polyutus defended the true faith, explaining his newfound allegiance to a much worthier emperor, the much worthier emperor being Jesus Christ. Finally, he was condemned to death for treason. But, before he really, but as he received his sentence, he did so with such great joy. He admonished the crowds of, uh, with such fervor that he left behind a wake of converts behind him, not only those that were present, but those for many, many decades, as he was led off to persecution and execution. Eventually, he met the martyr's sword by being beheaded. This saint, Saint Polyutus, understood that Christ's kingdom was not just a hobby. It wasn't a club. It was something that was worth living for, and in addition, it was something that was worth dying for. I think one of the easiest ways, or perhaps one of the most productive ways, for us to be productive citizens in the Christ kingdom and to become true Christians, which is our calling, is by our words. Think of it. Words are particular to human beings, are they not? For decades, scientists have been trying to teach dolphins or chimpanzees to talk, and they haven't succeeded, and they won't succeed. In fact, a two and a half or three year old child communicates better than the most highly trained dolphin or the most advanced um, chimpanzee. Language is one of the great gifts that God has given to human beings. It helps us, it is meant to help us know each other, to express our experiences, and to help us build up the human community. But unfortunately, language, due to original sin, has also become an instrument of destruction. Lies, gossip, innuendos, destructive criticisms, these cause more pains than all earthquakes and forest fires combined. They wound hearts, they divide families, communities, parishes, nations. They can cause feuds, infidelity, revolutions, and war. Christ came to redeem humanity from original sin he also came to redeem language as well. Imagine just how different this world would be if just a portion of Christians, a third, maybe even just a fourth of Christians, never gossiped. 
They never put up with gossip. They never lied. They never listened to lies. They never would speak badly of neighbor. And they made special efforts to speak well of people when they were not around. I would imagine that all of us can agree that this is difficult. This is a very high calling. But yet that's the idea that we are to strive for in building up Christ's kingdom. And that's the kind of king that we serve, Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us, stop judging. Stop condemning. He wants us to use this great gift of our language to build up our neighbors, our families, our communities by speaking the truth. As we gather today and as we gather and prepare for this week ahead, let's first ask Christ for his forgiveness for the times in which we've used our language, or maybe I should say abused our language, to tear down other people. And let's ask him as we receive the Eucharist today to give us the strength and the grace to be better stewards of that gift of our language. Again, the kingdom of God is at hand. And again, we are not members of some religious club. Rather, we are members of Christ's kingdom. We are followers and ambassadors of the eternal king. Our goal is to be citizens forever in heaven, the true kingdom. That starts in the here and now. Let us ask the Lord today to give us the courage in the grace to build up his kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the kingdom of God increases. We make our prayers together as we share in that loving plan of divine providence. For the growing church on earth, that it may welcome and redeem the cultures and values of all people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For leaders whose plans influence the economy, that they may encourage and support farmers and all those who help to bring food to our table, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who develop the land, that as they make this earth more productive, so may they reverence the natural environment created by God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our own community, that we may grow in grace as we welcome people to the life of faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the people of Corpus Christi Parish, for whom this Mass is offered, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you are the source of all goodness and grace. Hear the prayers we make as our intercessions for others through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, far good in the good of all his holy church. O God, who in the offerings presented here provide for the twofold needs of human nature, nourishing us with food and renewing us with your sacrament, grant, we pray, that the substance they provide may not fail us in body or in spirit through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give you thanks, truly just to give you glory, Father most holy, for you are the one God, living and true, existing before all ages, abiding for all eternity, dwelling in an unapproachable light. Yet you, you who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is, so that you might fill your creatures with blessing and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so, in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, and gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them, we too confess your name in exaltation, giving voice to every creature under heaven as we acclaim. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great and you have fashioned your words in wisdom and in love. You formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care, so that in serving you alone, the creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. And when through disobedience he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offer them covenants, and through the prophets you taught them to look forward to salvation. And you so love the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior. Made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart joy. To accomplish your plan he gave himself up to death, and by rising from the dead he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us, he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, may this same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings, that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the celebration of this great mystery which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. History of faith.
Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death, his descent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you, which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church, and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially your servant Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our apostolic administrator, the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There, with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, May we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through me bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but in the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. As this reception of your Holy Communion, O Lord, foreshadows the union of your faithful in you, so may it bring about unity in your church through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to thank any and all of you who helped um, either set up or clean up or even just participated last weekend in our parish picnic and procession events, the great procession after the 11 o'clock mass and the parish picnic. So thank you for all the help and support in which you continue to give your parish. After Mass this morning over in our parish hall, we have coffee and donuts, so I encourage you to please stop over there and um, enjoy yourselves. And then finally, we have um, one of our servers who's been serving for about a year and a half, Vincent Smith, standing right there next to the deacon. This week, he was accepted into the seminary and will be leaving this August to go to Mount St. Mary's in Maryland. So I ask that you please keep him and our other three seminarians in your prayers. I I can't speak for the entire country, but I can speak for the state of Colorado and um, the Archdiocese of St. Louis, which is where I'm originally from. There are no parishes that have four seminarians in them at this point, and yet we do here at Corpus Christi. So that that says a lot about um, the parish and all of your prayers. So please continue to keep these men and all um, men and women in formation in your prayers. Pray that you have a very blessed week. The Lord be with you. Bow down for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. May he let his face shine upon you and show you his mercy. Amen. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Amen. And through the intercession of St. Anthony of Padua, may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Go forth. The Mass is presented.